Are you a United States citizen? If you say that you are a United States citizen, which United States are you referring to? Anyone who lives in the District of Columbia is a United States citizen. The remaining population in the 50 states is the national citizenry of the nation. We are domiciled in various sovereign states, protected by the Constitution of those states from any direct rule of Congress over us. In the democracy, anyone who lives in those states known as Washington, D.C., Guam, Puerto Rico, or any of the other federally held territories is a citizen of the United States, D.C. We must be careful with our choice of words. We are not citizens of the United States. We are not subject to Congress. Congress has exclusive rule over a given territory, and we are not part of that territory. When did Congress get the authority to write the Internal Revenue Code? It is found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution. To pass that law, they only needed a majority vote. There is no other way that they could pass laws directly affecting individuals. Title 26, the Internal Revenue Code, was passed as law for another nation. Remember, our definition of nation, in quotes. But Title 26 is not consistent with the Bill of Rights. If you try to fight the IRS, you have no rights. The code does not give you any of your constitutional rights. It simply says, quote, you failed to file an income tax form. You failed to perform in some specific manner, unquote. Remember, under the common law, you are free to do whatever you want, as long as you do not infringe upon the life, liberty, or property of anyone else. If you do not want to perform, you don't have to. The only way you can be compelled to perform under the Constitution in the continental United States is if you have entered a contract. But if you are not under a contract, you cannot be compelled to perform. How can you be compelled to file an income tax form or any form? When Congress works for the Republic, every law it passes must be in harmony with the Constitution and Bill of Rights. But when Congress works for the legislative democracy, any law it passes becomes the law of the land. Remember, Congress has exclusive legislative control over federal territory. If you are charged with willful failure to file an income tax 1040 form, that is a law for a different nation. You are a non-resident alien to that nation. It is a foreign corporation to you. It is not the Republic of the Continental United States coming after you. It is a foreign nation. The legislative democracy of a foreign nation coming after you. If you get a notice of deficiency from the IRS, it is a presentment from the federal United States. So then you can use the UCC to dishonor it. And you can also mention that you are among the national citizenry of the continental United States and you are a non resident alien to the federal United States. You never lived in a federal territory and never had an income from the federal United States. Furthermore, you cannot be required to file or pay taxes under the compelled benefit of using the Federal Reserve notes because you have reserved your rights under the common law through the Uniform Commercial Code at 1-207. Original Intent of the Founders The Founding Fathers would never have created a government that was going to boss them around. There were 13 sovereign states, they were nations, and they joined together for protection from foreign enemies. 
They provided a means by which the union of the sovereign states could fend off foreign enemies. But they never gave the Congress of the Federal United States direct rule over any citizen of any state. They were not going to be ordered around by that government that they set up. Federal Regions the Supreme Court has declared that Congress can rule what Congress creates. Congress did not create the states, but Congress did create federal regions. So, Congress can rule the federal regions, but Congress cannot rule the states. How have we been tricked into federal regions? The zip code trick. Remember how the government always comes to us and says, quote, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you, unquote. The government went out into the various states and said, We don't want you to go to all that trouble of writing three or four letters to abbreviate the name of the state, such as A-R-I-Z for Arizona. Just write capital A, capital Z instead of capital A, lowercase r-i-z. Or you can just write capital W, capital Y for Wyoming instead of capital W, lowercase y-o. So all the states of the Union have got a new two-letter abbreviation. Even a state such as Rhode Island has a new abbreviation. It is capital R, capital I instead of capital R dot capital I dot. They've just left off the periods. When you use a two-letter state abbreviation, you are compelled to use a zip code. Because there are so many states, for example, which start with M, ME is Maine, MI is Michigan. How many people dot every I or make an I that looks like an E? With capital M-A, capital M-O, capital M-N, capital M-S, etc., and some sloppy writing, you couldn't tell one from another. So we have to use the zip code in order to tell them apart. But if you wrote capital M, lowercase i-c-h, or capital M, lowercase i-n-n, -N, or capital M, lowercase i-s-s, there would be no real problem telling which state it was. There's no harm in using the zip code if you lawfully identify your state. I found out that no state legislature has met to lawfully change the abbreviation of the state from the old abbreviation to the new. Uh, therefore, if you do not use the lawful abbreviation for your state, but use the shorter new abbreviation, you have to use the zip code. Look on page 11 of the zip code directory and it will tell you that the first digit of your zip code is the federal region in which you reside. If you use capital A capital Z for Arizona, you cannot use the state's constitution to protect you because you did not identify your state. You used the zip code which identifies which federal region you live in, and Congress may rule federal regions directly, but it cannot rule the citizens of any state. Accommodation Party Let's look at how the states have become the accommodation party to the national debt. There are many people I have talked to, including the governor, who are very concerned about this and who know that it could happen very soon. If America is declared a bankrupt nation, it will be a national emergency. The Federal Emergency Management Agency will take over, and anyone who opposes the new government of the creditors can be sent to a detention camp in Alaska. We will have no rights whatsoever. <clears throat> they have already set up prison camps with work camps nearby so the people can be used for slave labor. It could be the governors, legislators, and other leaders who would be hauled away to Alaska, while the people now disenfranchised from power would likely be chosen to run the new government. 
This could all happen very soon as the national debt is so large as to be unpayable. Even the interest on the debt is virtually unpayable. As I explained, the national debt, more than $3 trillion, and this was in the early 90s, folks, is not owed by the continental United States. It is the federal United States that had authority to borrow bank credit. When Congress worked for the continental United States, it could only borrow gold or silver. So the national debt was borrowed in the name of the federal United States. The federal United States has been bankrupt since 1938, but the federal United States had to trap the states into assuming the debt obligation of the federal debt. In the Uniform Commercial Code, we find the term, in quotes, accommodation party. How did the states become the accommodation party to the federal debt? The federal government, through our money system, made the states deal in federal reserve notes, which means that everything the states do is colorable. Under the colorable jurisdiction of the Uniform Commercial Code, all of the states are the accommodation party to the federal debt. Now, the concern is to find how we can get out of this situation. I told the governor that in the common law and the law of merchants, that's the international law merchant, there is a term called no interest contract. A no interest contract is void and unenforceable. So what is a no interest contract? If I were to insure a house that did not belong to me, that would be a no interest contract. I would just want the house to burn down. I would pay a small premium, perhaps a few hundred dollars, and insure it for $80,000 against fire. Then I'd be waiting for it to burn so I could trade my small premium for $80,000. Under the common law and under international law of the law merchant, that is called a no interest contract, and it is void and unenforceable in any court. Unconscionable contracts. In the Uniform Commercial Code, no interest contracts are called unconscionable contracts. The section on unconscionable contracts covers more than 40 pages in the Anderson Code. The federal United States has involved the states as the accommodation party to the federal debt, and I believe we could prove this to be an unconscionable contract. We should get some litigation into the courts before the government declares a national emergency, claiming that this state had no lawful responsibility for the national debt of the federal United States, because it became an accommodation party to this debt through an unconscionable contract. If we have this litigation before the courts under international law, when the nation is declared bankrupt, the creditors would have to settle this matter first, and it would delay them. They would want the new government to appear to be legitimate, so they could not just move right in and take over the state, because it would be in an international court. This is very important at this time. So now, the section of questions and review. Uh, a note. These are some of the questions asked after the main lecture. Some are restatements of material presented earlier, but they contain very valuable information which is worth repeating. And uh, allow me to say uh, real quickly, one thing is this. When I was researching 501c3 churches, <clears throat> One thing I found out is that uh, by way of an executive order that little George Bush signed while in office, he made all spiritual leaders uh, in 501c3 nonprofits, which most churches in the United States are, um, he essentially made them uh, an agent of... Um, uh, well, let's just say sort of a help agent 
in case of a national emergency, uh, their job under that um, executive order would to be to herd up all of their congregation into their various church buildings and uh, hold them there until uh, they decided where they wanted to ship them, what they wanted to do with them, whether they wanted to just kill them outright or imprison them or enslave them or something. You see, I think Howard Freeman thought when he did this talk in the early 90s that it would be right around the corner. Maybe he thought that it would be quicker and easier for them to take the guns away from Americans. I think they've found since the 90s that it's not going to be as easy as they hoped to do that, and they have to do that. If they don't do that, they're going to have an all-out war on their hands. Um, and even at this point in time, you know, the American military still are not all that willing to uh, attack their own countrymen. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe people, more people serving in the armed forces at all levels will start to wake up as to what they're doing, who they're serving, um, and come home and start protecting uh, their people. Uh, I do agree that um, the, the various individual states needs to take this to court as far as them being an accommodation party to the federal United States debt. Get that in court on the record. And I also think the fact that that is possible and that that should be done should be uh, something that clearly illustrates just how uh, bought and paid for uh, the leadership of our states are as well. So, um, into the Q&A. Uh, the first one is courtroom techniques. Question. How did you box in the judge? <clears throat> well, this is easy to do. If you don't know too much, it did, I didn't know too much, but I boxed them in. You must play a little dumb. If you are arrested and you go into court, just remember that in a criminal action, you have to understand the law, or it is a reversible error for the court to try you. If you don't understand the law, they can't try you. In any traffic case or tax case, you are called into court and the judge reads the law and then asks, do you understand the charges? The defendant, no, your honor. I do not. The judge, well, what's so difficult about the charge? Either you drove the wrong way on a one-way street or you didn't. You can only go one way on that street. And if you go the other way, it's a $50 fine. So what's so difficult about this that you don't understand? The defendant, well, your honor, it's not the letter of the law, but rather the nature of the law that I don't, under I don't understand. The Sixth Amendment of the Constitution gives me the right to request the court to explain the nature of any action against me, and upon my request the court has the duty to answer. I have a question about the nature of this action. The judge. Well, what is that? What do you want to know? Now he says aside, I always ask them some easy questions first, as this establishes that they are answering. You ask, defendant, well, your honor, is this a civil or a criminal action? The judge, it is criminal. If it were a civil action, there could be no fine, so it has to be criminal. That's what Freeman says in parentheses. So the defendant, thank you, your honor, for telling me that. Then the record will show that this action against, and say your name, is a criminal action. Is that right? The judge, yes. The defendant, I would like to ask another question about this criminal action. There are two criminal jurisdictions mentioned in the Constitution. One is under the common law and the other deals with international maritime contracts under an admiralty jurisdiction. Equity is civil and you said this is a criminal action, so it seems it would have to be under either the common law or maritime law. 
But what puzzles me, Your Honor, is that there is no corpus delecti here that gives this court a jurisdiction over my person and property under the common law. Therefore, it doesn't appear to me that this court is moving under the common law. The judge. No, I can assure you this court is not moving under the common law. Defendant. Well, thank you, Your Honor, but now you make the charge against me even more difficult to understand. The only other criminal jurisdiction would apply only if there were an international maritime contract involved, that I was a party to it, and it had been breached, and the court was operating in an admiralty jurisdiction. I don't believe I have ever been under any international maritime contract, so I would deny that one exists. I would have to demand that such a contract, if it does exist, be placed into evidence so that I may contest it. But surely this court is not operating under an admiralty jurisdiction. Now, Freeman says, you just put the words in the judge's mouth. So the judge responding, <clears throat> no, I can assure you we're not operating under an admiralty jurisdiction. We're not out in the ocean somewhere. We're right here in the middle of the state of whatever, any state. No, this is not an admiralty jurisdiction. So the defendant, thank you, Your Honor. But now I'm even more puzzled than ever. If this charge is not under the common law or under admiralty, and those are the only two criminal jurisdictions mentioned in the Constitution, what kind of jurisdiction could this court be operating under? The judge. It's statutory jurisdiction. The defendant. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. I'm glad you told me that, but I've never heard of that jurisdiction. So, if I have to defend under that, I would need to have the rules of criminal procedure for statutory jurisdiction. Can you tell me where I might find those rules? Now, Freeman says to the side, there are no rules for statutory jurisdiction. So, the judge will get very angry at this point and say, if you want answers to questions like that, you get yourself a licensed attorney. I'm not allowed to practice law from the bench. Defendant. Oh, Your Honor, I don't think anyone would accuse you of practicing law from the bench if you just answer a few questions to explain to me the nature of this action so that I may defend myself. Judge. I told you before, I'm not going to answer any more questions. Do you understand that? If you ask any more questions in regard to this, I'm going to find you in contempt of court. Now, if you can't afford a licensed attorney, the court will provide you with one. But if you want those questions answered, you must get yourself a licensed attorney. Defendant, thank you, Your Honor. But let me just see if I got this straight. Has this court made a legal determination that it has authority to conduct a criminal action against me, the accused, under a secret jurisdiction, the rules of which are known only to this court and licensed attorneys, thereby denying me the right to defend my own person? He has no answer for that. The judge will probably postpone the case and eventually just let it go. In this way, you can be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. But you must not go into court with a chip on your shoulder as a wolf in black sheep country. Remember Jesus' words, I send you out as sheep in wolf country. Be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. Sheep do not attack wolves directly. Just be an innocent little lamb who just can't understand the charge. And remember, they can't try you criminally if you don't understand the charge. That would be automatically a reversal error on appeal. Now, the Social Security problem. If I were a young man, 18 or 20 years old, and just starting out 
in my first job, I would not want Social Security. With my signature on the application, I would write, in quotes, without prejudice, UCC 1-207, end quote. And I would reserve my common law rights. But why wouldn't I want Social Security today? I got into the Social Security system in the 1930s, and I paid into it dollars that had good purchasing power. Now I'm getting a promised return in Federal Reserve notes, which have considerably less value. For example, in 1940, you could buy a deluxe Chevrolet for $800. With today's Federal Reserve notes, that won't buy you the rear fender, or rear fenders and trunk on a new Chevy. If I were a young man, I would not want to put Federal Reserve notes into Social Security now and get back something later like the German mark after World War I when it took a billion to buy a loaf of bread. They will give you every Federal Reserve note back that they promised you, but it might not buy anything. So, assurance. Under the Uniform Commercial Code, you have the right, in any agreement, to demand a guarantee of performance. So, don't go to them and say, quote, I want to rescind my Social Security number, unquote, or, quote, I refuse to take it, unquote. Just take it easy and say, quote, I would be happy to get a Social Security number and enter into this contract. But I have a little problem. How can I have assurance before I enter this contract that the purchasing power of the Federal Reserve notes I get back at the end of the contract will be as good as the ones that I pay in at the beginning? They can't guarantee that, and you have a right under the UCC to assurance of performance under the contract. So tell them, well, I cannot enter this contract unless the government will guarantee to pay me at the end of the contract with the same value Federal Reserve notes that I'm paying in. Both may be called Federal Reserve notes, but you know that these Federal Reserve notes don't hold their value. I want assurance on this contract that the Federal Reserve notes that I get in my retirement will buy as much as the ones that I'm giving to you now in my working years. They can't make that guarantee. If they won't give you that guarantee, just say, I'd be glad to sign this, but if you can't guarantee performance under the contract, I'm afraid I cannot enter the contract. Now, did you refuse, or did they refuse? You can get the sections of the Uniform Commercial Code which grant the right to have assurance that the contract you have entered will be fulfilled properly, that the return will equal the investment, and you can reject the contract using the code. Using their own system of law, you can show that they cannot make you get into a contract of that nature. Just approach them innocently like a lamb. It is very important to be gentle and humble in all dealings with the government and the courts. Never raise your voice or show anger. In the courtroom, always be polite and build the judge up. Call him your honor. Give him all the honor he wants. It does no good to be difficult, but rather be cooperative and ask questions in a way that leads the judge to say the things which you need to have in the record. Ah, now, the court reporter. In many courts, there will be a regular court reporter. He gets his job, or she uh, gets her job, at the judge's pleasure. So he doesn't want to displease, or she doesn't want to displease the judge. The court reporter is sworn to give an accurate transcript of every word that is spoken in the courtroom. But if the judge makes a slip of the tongue... He just turns to the court reporter and says, quote, I think you had better leave that out of the transcript. Just say I got a little too far ahead of you, and you couldn't quite get everything in, unquote. So, this will be missing from the transcript. In one case, we brought a licensed court reporter with us, and the judge got very angry and said, This court has 
a licensed court reporter right here, and the record of this court is this court reporter's record. No other court reporter's record means anything to this court. We responded with, of course, Your Honor, we're certainly glad to, uh, glad to use your regular court reporter, but you know, Your Honor, sometimes things move so fast that a court reporter gets a little behind and doesn't quite keep up with it all. Wouldn't it be nice if we had another licensed court reporter in the courtroom, just in case your court reporter got a little behind, so that we could fill in from this other court reporter's data? I'm sure, Your Honor, that you want an accurate transcript. I like to use the saying, give a bad dog a good name and he'll live up to it. The judge went along with it and from that moment on he was very careful of what he said. These are little tricks to getting around in court. This is how to be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove when we enter into a courtroom. There are others using the same information presented here who end up in jail, handcuffed and hit over the head because they approach the situation with a chip on their shoulder. They try to tell the judge what the law is and that he is a no-good scoundrel and so on. Just be wise and harmless. So, UCC 1-207 Review it is so important to know and understand the meaning of, quote, without prejudice, UCC 1-207, closed quote, in connection with your signature, that we should go over this once more. It is very likely that a judge will ask you what it means, so please learn and understand this carefully. The use of, in quotes, without prejudice, UCC, and that's capital UCC, 1-207, closed quote, in connection with my signature, indicates that I have reserved my common law right not to be compelled to perform under any contract that I did not enter into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally. And furthermore, I do not accept the liability associated with the compelled benefit of any unrevealed contract or commercial agreement. Once you state that, it is all the judge needs to hear. Under the common law, a contract must be entered into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally by both parties, or it can be declared void and unenforceable. You are claiming the right not to be compelled to perform under any contract that you did not enter into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally, and you do not accept the liability associated with the compelled benefit of any unrevealed contract or agreement. The compelled benefit is the privilege to use Federal Reserve notes to discharge your debts with limited liability, rather than to pay your debts with silver coins. It is a compelled benefit, because there are no silver coins in circulation. You have to eat and you can only buy food with the medium of exchange provided by the government. You are not allowed to print your own money, so you are compelled to use theirs. This is the compelled benefit of an unrevealed commercial agreement. If you have not made a valid, timely, and explicit reservation of your rights under UCC 1-207, and you simply exercise this benefit rendered by the government, you will be obligated, under an implied agreement, to obey every statute, ordinance, and regulation passed by the government at all levels, federal, state, and local. In conclusion, the editor of this transcript has taken great liberties in putting it to paper <clears throat> in an effort to make it readable and somewhat compact. He wishes to offer his gratitude to Howard Freeman for the opportunity to work with information so absolutely vital to our survival as dignified, unenslaved 
human beings. I would say men and women. That's me. He must also ask Mr. Freeman's forgiveness for any errors committed in getting this imprint. The purpose of this transcript, as stated in the foreword, is to make this knowledge and wisdom available to as many people as will take the time and trouble to read it. It is meant to be supplemental to Mr. Freeman's recorded lectures, not a substitute. Indeed, there is no substitute for hearing him present this material in his own words. It is not just the law and the facts that are important here, but the way they are used. His numerous reminders of Jesus' commission to be like sheep among wolves cannot be overstated and is certainly good advice to us in all dealings, not just in court or with the government. Hearing him explain this in his own words brings to life the practical application and usefulness of being wise and harmless. In fact, after being introduced to this approach, it becomes difficult to imagine that any other way of defending oneself from the government would be effective. It goes without saying that none of this information presented here is in any way, shape, or form offered as legal advice. For that, as you know, you must, quote, get yourself a licensed attorney. Having said that, <clears throat> I feel obligated to point out that one of the most difficult aspects of dealing with a licensed attorney, even a good one, may be knowing just whose side he or she is on. He or she is, after all, an officer of the court. So, for those of us who have concluded that having an attorney means that you will soon be chained, gagged, and led to the gallows, this information may be indispensable. For the extraordinary challenges of appearing in court in one's own person, in propria persona, there are few reliable sources of information. Learning to defend ourselves, that is, being responsible instead of turning over one more area of our lives to professionals, in quotes, may be the only way to have any chance of digging ourselves out of this pit of legal tyranny. Perhaps the greatest problem we face in education today is the matter of widespread legal illiteracy. Naturally, there will always be a number of people who just don't care about these issues who either, one, have a soft life, which is supported and maintained by this secret system of law and the institutions which have grown up around it. I can make a bundle buying these IRS seized homes cheap and reselling them. <laughs> or, two, don't believe that anything can be done about it. You can't fight City Hall. Or, three, simply don't have the energy or inclination to do anything about it. That's nice. But let's see what's on TV. So, for those good citizens, in quotes, this whole effort may seem useless or even threatening. But is this writer's view that God did not intend for us to spend our lives in statutory slavery for the benefit of a handful of secret world manipulators, even if the, in quotes, masters grant us some token pleasures and diversions? Human dignity requires much more than entertainment. The door is there and the key exists. We must find it and we must use it to return to freedom. Let us discover the mistakes we have made. Let us find truth. Let us apply it with meekness and wisdom. Let us, <clears throat> and let us gently but firmly reclaim the precious freedom which we have so foolishly given up. This from September 22nd, 1991. Now this part is important too, but unfortunately, um, the, the, I think the website isn't here, but the address and, uh, and phone number may still be good. I know that I'm pretty sure this ministry it also still has a YouTube channel, but it, is, it says um, 
So this is who was putting this out. It says, for more information, I encourage anyone who is interested enough to read this far to obtain a set of tapes of Howard Freeman and listen to them carefully. A donation of $4 per tape would be appropriate. This information was taken from tapes numbered uh, 90 through 30. Uh, nine, I'm sorry, not through, but I guess 90-30, 90-31, 90-32, and 90-33. Uh, which may be ordered from America's Promise Ministries, care of P.O. Box 157, Sandpoint, Idaho, Postal Zone, <laughs> 8664TDC. Now, I don't know the difference between them putting in postal zone as opposed to a zip code. That's strange. But I don't know nearly as much as Howard Freeman does about these things, but hopefully there's time and all of us can work at these things and share information together. I think that's one of the greatest beauties of, um, you know, um, things that are, are meant to harm us more than anything, like YouTube and, and a lot of the social media online. There is a phone number. It's area code 208-265-5405. Um, so, anyways, and there's uh, a little bit more information on this. Uh, this document, <clears throat> uh, this document can be gotten at. Uh, I think I mentioned it, or or I didn't. I definitely put the uh, link in um, from archive. dot uh, org. And so uh, he does go on just a few uh, footnotes here at the end. Okay, uh, footnote one: colorable, that which is in appearance only, and not in reality. What it purports to be, hence counterfeit, feigned, having the appearance of truth. Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition. <laughs> 2. Actually, it is better to use a rubber stamp because this demonstrates that you had previously reserved your rights. The simple fact that it takes several days or a week to order and get a stamp shows that you had reserved your rights before signing the document. Yeah. Uh, point three. Anderson Uniform Commercial Code. Lawyers Cooperative Publishing Company. Now that's where he says you need to actually get those pages from. If a library has Anderson's Uniform Commercial Code and... Um, um, I read that uh, in part one of these two videos. So get it from Anderson. Uh, I'm going to be looking for that myself uh, to get those pages copied. Um, point four, it's very important to get it into the record that you do not understand the charges. That's the most important thing. Get it into the record that you don't understand the charges. With that in the record, the court cannot move forward to judge the facts. It cannot. This will be covered later on page 19. Uh, for more about this, see, PHC page 18. Um, and that would, I guess, be in the uh, UCC. Um, okay, so point six, UCC 3-415. It is the uh, accommodation party, in quotes. One who signs commercial paper in any capacity for the purpose of lending his name to another party to the instrument, such as a party is a surety. And in parentheses, surety, one who undertakes to pay money or to do some other act in the event that his principal fails therein. Parenthesis closed. And point seven. See UCC 1-201. General definitions. Three. Quote, uh, agreement means the bargain of the parties in fact as found in their language or by implication from other circumstances including courses, dealing or usage of trade or course of performance. And that concludes the written portion of this document. Now, also in this document are a number of... Um, document blanks that one can use in uh, legal and lawful proceedings. 
So again, uh, follow the link that I left on the first portion of this video, and I'll leave it on this uh, because it's just full of full of very good tools. There are also hyperlinks uh, that you can go to from opening this in Acrobat or maybe other programs that will give you other um, audios by Howard Freeman uh, and I believe some of these are also other text documents uh, from Howard Freeman uh, very good stuff anything you can get from Howard Freeman is pretty valuable now I know a lot of people have so far and will probably continue to for quite some time come to either the first or this video um, and maybe other videos I'm able to make in which I'm just reading from uh, transcripts of Howard Freeman or maybe others that share similar points of view as he does remember something there are actually a lot of guys out there who are are very they're smart they're well informed they know the law they understand contracts um, there's one channel I started listening to recently I think it's uh, the channels called I'm a free man it's a guy from California and he explains a lot of things um, that are kind of difficult for most people to understand and most people don't understand and I recommend all of us spending at least a certain amount of time uh, getting to understand the law what is really the law what is the law as the law should stand and what does it mean to be lawful and who are you really okay there's either the thing that they have turned us into unbeknownst to us and there is the thing that you are really um, I would suggest people find out what and who they are really and spend a good uh, amount of time trying to get to know how you can maneuver in the system we find ourselves in today I know a lot of people when they come to this understanding of how things are how we've been tricked the way things are and how um, like the transcriber said at the very end concerning you know the different people and what their excuses would be we're gonna find that most of the people around us don't want to do jack about this they're either lazy and um, they're comfortable or content or like you said in point one a lot of them are actually making their livelihood and a very comfortable one at that off of this system the real sick part is a good deal of these people are the people who are inhabiting your church buildings not only the parishioners but the clergy and that's one of the really angering and scary parts to all of this and you need to be aware of this and um, if you're anything like me when you start becoming aware of this um, you're probably going to be very angry and uh, you might not know how to cope with that because I had a hard time even believing it I mean how could so many people be uh, professing to be Christians which you know like Freeman said over and over in this document were to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves and the the vast majority of of people in the whole world today that profess Christianity are just the opposite they are as wise as doves and as harmful as serpents so I could understand having a very strong reaction to this I think a lot of the advice that Freeman gives is very good advice I know that a lot of people would have different opinions on how to go about things um, some people are involved in this sort of sovereignty uh, movement which is completely disassociating uh, with anything having to do with the federal United States and I'm beginning to understand that and what that means I, there are many different points of view but the one that I think it has the most wisdom concerning what Freeman says is not going into court or trying to deal with a policeman 
in this way where you have a chip on your shoulder and you know the law and you know your rights and that's going to make everything go well and make them behave the way they're supposed to because that's not the way the world is that's not the way the world works and that's not the way that evil people work and you know it and I know it so I would just encourage everybody to to use that wisdom to their advantage so uh, until next time, I hope this really uh, empowered everybody. All right. God bless you.